Before I begin, let me just make mention, please, of one announcement for prayer that I think is important. The uh, Janice Kennedy that under normal situations, and Andy, her husband, sit back there in the corner, and a uh, special chair for her. Forgive me for a moment. I'm going to get rid of a cough drop there that is plugging me up. Um, she's in a tough situation, and Andy's in a tough situation right now, and they need our prayers. So would you please lift him and her particularly up in prayer. It uh, is one of the privileges I think that we have is to pray for one another. Now this morning as we welcome you and we're thankful for those that are online as well that are that are uh, watching today. We are continuing of course in our study in 2 Corinthians and we come to chapter 6 and a little bit of a shifting of gears here. And what we're dealing with is that separation that really is throughout the Word of God. If you want to see it clearly, you can go to such places. In fact, Tyler did that this morning as Psalm 1, the blessed one and the others. There's really only two classifications of people, those that know Jesus Christ and those that don't. Those that are privileged and blessed to have a future in glory, and those who unfortunately will be lost in a terrible place for all eternity. I started to call this, and probably uh, very well could have, a title for this as Dedicated or Deceived. Dedicated or Deceived. Now the focus, of course, of what Paul is preaching here is to a church in Corinth, and this is a troubled church, and we have already seen that he's had to defend himself against those that have entered this church and have proclaimed a, uh, themselves to be enemies of Christ by a different gospel, which is not the gospel, of course, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they've targeted Paul for all kinds of accusations, and Paul has had to defend himself, and in so doing, he has told us what a Christian is. Now that focus of his defense is changing here, because now where he was focusing on himself, and with that, we were being blessed to see what a Christian really is, now his focus is going to be pushed back on them. And that focus is, are you genuine or not? I've given you the gospel. I've told you about myself and what makes me what I am. It's sort of like saying, what is, now it's your turn. It's your turn. And he will lead, you know, all the way down in and, uh, this chapter to verse 14 where he says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. And then he goes on to explain why. But in the meantime, we have this separation that is taking place here that we're going to see in the beginning verses of this. And this is all built, I think, around the particular uh, verse that I will say is very key in all of this, and that is chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, new things come. Oh, that's a significant verse. A significant passage that ought to be ingrained upon each one of us. There's not really in that statement any place in between. We are either committed and dedicated to Christ or we are deceived. And I can speak to you this morning as one who spent the early portion of my life deceived. And so I know what that is. And I trust now, not perfectly, but I'm working hard at it to be dedicated to my Savior. And I trust that you are too. And not because in my own strength, 
but because he got a hold of me. Oh, and I pray he's got a hold of you this morning. And if he hasn't, that he will. That he will. And we're going to be talking about that. Let me bow and ask the Lord's blessing on our time again together, please. Father, we ask you for your mercies today. There's not a person here that doesn't need your compassion and your tender mercies that flow from your throne of grace. I pray, Father, for Janice Kennedy. Lord, you are the great physician. Oh, I pray that you would comfort her mind and heart, comfort Andy, Father, and be with them and put your loving arms around them and that you would strengthen her if it please you, Lord. Please bless them, Father, as only you can. We look to thee. And Father, bless us here with your word. Strengthen us. We need thee, Father. Oh, how we need thee. We need thy truth. We love thy truth and thy ways. Teach us thy ways, O Lord, and guide and direct us that we might please you in the time you have given each one of us here. We ask in the name of our Savior. Amen. Now you probably know that preachers and teachers are at the same time the most loved and, and at the same time most hated individuals. Um, why is that? Well, to those who believe in the gospel and if the preacher is preaching the gospel, they are loved. While to those who reject the gospel, they irritate, they agitate. And they are labeled by many as a bunch of troublemakers. And, of course, in our society, that's going to grow and grow, and it already is. And there's a lot of other ugly things that are going to be said that I could not repeat. And Christ said that if they have hated me, they will hate you also. There is a love-hate relation ship there and it's not just pastors because by the way that is going to extend to everyone who names the name of Christ we are targets of the evil one and he is actively serving to do everything he can to destroy us and to destroy our testimony now God is greater than he is praise God for that but he's there, and you and I, all of us, are going to be tested. And Paul is experiencing this, and the members in the Corinthian church must decide if they will follow the teaching of the flesh, self-serving, exalting self, self-proclaimed authorities who have entered this church, or they will follow Paul's teaching, who follows Christ in everything that he does and is given to us as an example for that very reason. To one degree or another, this is always the issue. This is the separation among men. This morning when we were in Luke chapter 3, our brother brought out the fact that Christ has his winnowing fork and he separates the chaff from the wheat. And that's what's going on among us in this world as we live in the circumstances that come our way. We are being sifted, as it were, each one of us, and we need to recognize that, and that is all purposeful. But brother and sister, it won't matter 10,000 years from now, will it? It won't matter 100 years from now. It won't matter 50 years from now. <laughs> we'll be with the Lord Jesus, and all the tears are going to be wiped away, and all the troubles and trials will be something of the distant past. I don't think we're going to give him a whole lot of thought when we're in his glory. But right now, we're facing those things, aren't we? And Paul has painted here a peculiar picture, a picture of what Christ called the narrow way. And if we look back at chapter 5 and verse 13, if you're in 2 Corinthians, he says, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Notice that. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Paul had a, you could call it a two-pronged, and one of those prongs is bigger than the other, but he had a two-pronged approach to living. 
first of all, was God. It's if I'm beside myself, if I appear to be a, a nutcase, if I am over the top when you're what you consider, and I'm irritating and getting under your skin and all of those kinds of things, it is for God. That's something to get worked up about. Much more so, by the way, than the Super Bowl, okay? <laughs> Since it's very timely for that today. And the second thing is, it's for you. And doesn't that fit with love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself? And it all fits within this issue of those truly saved are these new creatures that are not living for themselves, but for him who saved them and for others that might know him. On their, to, to know him is the most important issue by far above anything and everything that anyone could conceive of. And so being a Christian doesn't therefore fit the world, and it cannot. It causes friction, and therefore there are always those pressing a form of Christianity into the church, and many, many, many have bought into this, which is really not Christianity at all. It's not the narrow road. It's a redefined broad road that leads to destruction. Now, in this latter portion of Paul's explanation in chapter 5 and verse 20, where he says we are ambassadors for Christ, he made a point of those in Christ are the ones that are ambassadors, not others, but those exclusively that are in Christ, which really relates back to, again, chapter 5, verse 17. And so this places even greater weight on those who follow Christ. They must proactively serve Christ with His message and against the pressures of all of this opposition coming from many who do not want to hear it or have anything to do with it because it's disturbing to them. And this is the difficulty, I think, that Christ meant when he stated, you must take up your cross and follow me. That was his test of obedience, wasn't it? He went to the cross on behalf of us. And we are to bear our uh, trials and difficulties trusting God in the same way that the Lord Jesus did. And, we, and if it means that uh, there's all kinds of tacky and ugly things that happen to us, so be it. Christ himself said, birds have nest, uh, uh, and, uh, but the Son of Man has no place to, to lay his head. Because he was more concerned about living and doing the Father's will than he was all of his personal conveniences. And he wasn't at home here, and neither will his true ambassadors who are faithful to him find things naturally convenient here. Now, we have a lot of blessings, even being in this nice building and comfortable seats. God has been gracious to us, but that's not the important thing, of course. The important thing is, am I truly serving him? Am I about my father's business? So Paul, after laying this foundation, he begins to challenge these Corinthians about their faith. Is their faith genuine? Will it stand the test of the circumstances and oppositions that come against it? Will they, like Paul, stand firm against those who enter with all kinds of, of magnetism and charisma and anything else that you can imagine and have a little twist on the gospel, a little difference and, and you know, they've got a little bit of humanism in there and maybe a little prosperity and make things a little brighter and shinier than this old hard gospel message that Paul was preaching. Will they be able to handle that? And we have to be to ask ourselves, the same thing. Now, the Lord Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say in Luke 6? 
or even in the, to the Corinthian church, it's interesting that at the end of the first Corinthian letter, one of the last things said is, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. Wow. Now that's a separation, isn't it? There's no fancy footwork around that. It's just cutting the line black and white. And look ahead just for a moment in 2 Corinthians to the end of 2 Corinthians, chapter 13. Look at verse 5, one of the last things that Paul says to this church. He says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. Paul knows that he is addressing this church, and when he does, that he is speaking to true saints, those who are born again, and also false saints. And to the first, he encourages continuance, and to the latter, he encourages, get right with God. Repent of Him. Get rid of all your self-righteousness. Dump all that stuff and look to Christ alone. Come to Him. Seek Him. Be in His Word. Pray and follow Him. And so we begin to look at this, what I've called here service qualification. The qualities for service of our Lord are faithfulness and obedience built upon a new creation or a new creature from verse 517. Because this is our sanctification, our spiritual battle in this life until we exit this life. And being a Christian, by the way, in case you haven't figured this out yet, is not a bowl of cherries. And I happen to particularly like cherries, so I, I thought that was a good thing to say. And, but it's depicted like that to many people today. That's, that's, the, that's the way it's presented that, you know, if you'll come join us and do this and, and uh, everything's going to be a smooth, sweet, little highway for you and you're just going to be delighted to out, out of your mind but it's a conflict you see because we don't fit this world and without God working in our heart and bringing conviction to serve the Lord in the difficulties of life we are not qualified to call ourselves new creatures and there are too many people carrying all sorts of other messages, claiming a better way, a happier, more pleasing way. But only those in Christ will separate from such. And separation is going to become a big deal here. If, again, if you look down at verse 14 of chapter 6, do not be bound together with unbelievers. Don't entwine yourself around them. They're going to rub off on you. They're going to take you down a pathway that you don't want to be on if you're in Christ Jesus. And so as he states this, he begins this chapter here, says, and working together with him. Now, this is attached to the last verse, 521, that he who knew no, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It is attached together with that. And it's a reminder because Christ has been faithful to go to the cross. And you see this little turn here where the light, so to speak, is shining on Paul, and the work of Christ in his heart is now shined on us, by extension, us being the Corinthian church, and by extension, all that claim the name of Christ. 
And it's now our role as those in Christ to serve a beneficial purpose, which he mentioned in chapter 5 and verse 20. We are ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors. For, we're representatives of him to the world. This is how the world knows what a Christian is, how the world knows who Christ is. It's through his people today, pointing, of course, through the word of God to Christ himself. Now, Whereas before conversion, we were held captive by Satan. Now we are held dependent upon God in constant prayer. And that's why we are told to pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because the phrase with him here is an accurate phrase, even though it has been added by the translators. Because if we look back at verse 519 and the antecedent in 519, where it says, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. It shows us that we are working for God and together with God to accomplish his purposes in this world. Now, to, to really grasp this is this need to, first of all, to understand our privilege in that. This is not something like taking an ugly pill. There's not a greater privilege that could ever be bestowed on anyone. And it has with it, of course, the obligation and the responsibility to be God's representative. But it is also the greatest privilege that any person could possibly have. And this, by the way, is lordship. This is clear from Scripture. We're in, what, what does it tell us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20? Know you not that you're the temple of the Lord? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You're not your own. I'm not my own. If we are in Christ, that's what he said in, in, uh, in chapter 5 and verse 21, that he who knew no sin became sin for us. We're not our own. He bought us with an in, immeasurable, incredible price that cannot be imagined. Therefore, glorify God in your body, which is in everything that you do. It's not optional. In fact, there's so much in the Bible, I, I just pick out one thing as just a reminder. How about the parable of the talents that is found in Matthew 25? The Lord Jesus there is the landowner, the one that leaves and is going to return, and he leaves these particular ones in charge. That's you and I, brother. And each one is given talents, and some use their talents and, 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 and benefit the landowner. And, but when he comes back, he finds that one that doesn't do anything. He buries his talent in the ground. He doesn't have anything but condemnation for that one. And you see, this is the same sort of thing we can apply to ourselves in John 15, we have the picture of Christ saying that I am the vine, you are the branches. And he talks about there that as the branches, if we don't produce anything, we are broken off the vine and cast into the fire. We are worthless. Our role like Christ is to be in our Father's business. This is something that people get all twisted up with. You're talking about work salvation, aren't you? I'm not talking about work salvation, but I am talking about working in your salvation. And you better be doing that. You better be about your father's business. If you want to accuse the Lord Jesus of working for his salvation, I guess he always did the will of his father. We are all found in Philippians 2.12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who works in you both to will and work his good pleasure. And if we're not, and if we belong to him, I think this is a neglected passage. Our brother covered this not too terribly long ago, but look at Hebrews chapter 12 for a moment. 
here we are. Each one of us are struggling. I know that. I struggle. But the writer of Hebrews tells us in verse 4 of chapter 12, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. <laughs> no. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. If you're in Christ, you're his son. You're God's son. He says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. If you're in Christ Jesus, you better get serious about serving him or you're going to be in the woodshed. And the woodshed's not a very happy place to be. And if you're failing him and you're not in the woodshed, you better look carefully and see if you're a son. You better test yourself, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, a very serious matter, a very serious accountability. Because we are to serve beneficially for Christ and before others. How? As a light in the darkness. And those who flounder in this also bank up against what Paul says next, which is very important. The issue of peace that comes with assurance of salvation if we're not about his business. If you want to talk about the happy Christian and the prosperous life and all of that, that's really found in obedience. Not the, not the sense that the prosperity gospel preaches, but in the sense that the true word of God preaches. He's not talking about everything turning up roses for you, but he is talking about a peace that passes all understanding. He's talking about a joy that the world does not know because those in Christ are overcomers. Now, we don't work for our salvation, but we sure do work in it. And justification and sanctification cannot be separated. If one is truly saved, he's a new creature and is moving according to a new commander and a new pattern. Remember the words of Christ Jesus that are so important in that great Sermon on the Mount. You will know them, those that are saved, by their fruits. And there are three prominent marks in 1 John, if you've ever studied that little epistle, which is all about assurance that you may know that you have eternal life. There are three marks in that book, love, faith, and obedience. And they are all interconnected. It is a chain that cannot be broken. Love, faith, and obedience. And certainly other things can be added. We can think of Galatians 5, uh, where, where we're given love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And in all these things, we're not talking about perfection, but they are marks of those operating in the Spirit of God and engaged in the sanctification process. It has to do not only with the things that I do outwardly, but who I am. That can be seen in me by my character before others in the circumstances, the trials, and the pressures of life. Again, not perfectly, for none of us can mark up to that. But nonetheless, less. it is the practice and the character of them all. Because God is at work in the restoration business, working in our hearts. And he is the one who creates trials and challenges and instruction, restoring man to fellowship with himself and putting us into service. And this service is the true gospel with a true testimony. And that's what he says here. I know I'm not moving very fast. I'm going to have to get going here. 
He says, working together with him, we also urge you to receive the grace of God, or excuse me, not to receive the grace of God in vain. Urge is that little word lomen with parakale, which is part of the word paraclete, which is the same word used back in verse 520 where we beg people to come to Christ, to know Christ, with the added paracol, which means come alongside, showing intimate, passionate concern. He says, we urge you not to receive the gospel in vain, or the grace of God in vain. Now, this cannot mean conversion. He's not talking about that. But no one can lose their new birth if you're born again. He's talking about the privileges that these had had being under the grace of God message. Look again back at chapter 5 and verse 20. And look with me just for a moment forward. We can see this even more clearly when we look at chapter 11. Look at chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. Here is Paul saying later, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Another gospel should be so repulsive to us that we literally can't stand it. And Paul parallels this statement that he makes with the Old Testament back in our text beginning in verse 2, where he quotes out of Isaiah 49.8, and he says, For he says, quoting that, At the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. This is God speaking through Isaiah. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Isaiah poured out his heart to wicked Israel that was rejecting the, the truth of the prophets, rejecting the law, and, and uh, moving into idolatry and every manner of wickedness before God. And the prophet spoke, pleading with them, Behold, now is the acceptable time of salvation. Now is the time to turn in repentance to your God and worship Him only and live for Him only and serve Him only. Now is the time to do that. And he's warning here in this church, these wavering people, that to not to fully embrace this falseness, but to embrace true salvation while it is near. Not to neglect God's word. Not to neglect the God of truth. We read in Acts 18 that Paul spent 18 months with these Corinthians teaching them night and day the word of truth. And yet, and that is true today with all of the heritage that we have in this country and this nation and all the, the uh, statements of faith and the Bible and all the preaching and teaching that has gone on and still goes on, what we see so often is buildings full of people saying, Lord, Lord, in various forms, but do not have a true saving relationship with Christ. And that's why the Lord Jesus would say, out of 721 of Matthew, many will say to me in that day, or I could, that's 723, 721 is, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. That's a very serious, sobering statement. 
do you recognize that one of Satan's greatest ploys of deception, just like he, say, he started in the garden with Adam and Eve, has God said? You see, we twist it. We don't like this hard message. We don't like all of that that's said about us. I'm offended by all of that that is found in the Scripture. And so we, find, we try to find a smoother, easier road, a more palatable message that can be sugar-coated and sweetened and melted down where I can be religious without really knowing Christ Jesus. It's certainly one of Satan's greatest ploys of deception, and he uses the pulpit, doesn't he? Look over at Galatians. Let's just be reminded of this for a minute. Galatians chapter 1. This is the same theme that goes throughout the Scripture. There's this false message. There's this true message. There's this wickedness that's built around man-centeredness, and there is the only hope which is found in Christ, and the two cannot possibly come together. What does Paul say in Galatians chapter 1? Galatians chapter 1, look at verse 6. I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him, that is Christ, who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and wanting to distort the gospel of Christ. But notice this, but even if we are an angel from heaven, this is, you know, even if it was something, so to speak, supernatural, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. He's not to be listened to. He's not to be followed. He's not to be accepted in the beloved. He's accursed. And if that isn't enough, he goes and he repeats the same thing again. Let's drive this nail into your head. Drive it in there, in your head, that you can get it. That if someone's preaching and teaching a gospel, it's not the gospel of Christ. Get away from there. Have nothing to do with that person. You know, we can't go. I know when I was a kid, I used to hear on the, the TV set, you wouldn't even hear that anymore, but it used to be, go to the church of your choice. I used to say that, you know, Saturday night, go to the church of your choice. Let me tell you something. You can't go to the church of your choice. No, you can't. Your flesh will take you in the wrong direction. You need to go to the church of God's choice. God's choice, the one that matches this scripture. And I hope and pray that the reason you're here is because we're trying to teach God's word. We're giving you the truth of God's word, not because we're trying to make you happy and comfortable and, and pump you up or something else or entertain you, but that you and I and our families and everybody that we know, all of our loved ones and people we love, they all need Christ. They need the truth of God. And it is the truth that sets men free. Amen. It's not anything else. It won't work. A little religion, a little of this, a little morality, nah, it's not going to do it. It's like dressing up as Peter talks about in his second epistle there. It's like dressing up a pig. He's still a pig. We must be changed. We must be these new creatures that are spoken of again in 517. Now, and I lost my place here. <laughs> Let me go take you to James just for a minute. I think this is probably the most, uh, right after Hebrews, the most controversial text in all of Scripture, even in evangelical circles. There's been all these arguments and fusses over this that it's not grace because of what James says. James deals with this deception that is related to being a new creature. 
which is really all part of the gospel. Isn't that the gospel? If any man be in, anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away because God's working in that life. God has intervened in that life. God has made someone born again. Now, in James, he deals with this. In fact, James 1.18 says here, In the exercise of his will, God's will, how? He brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. He brought us forth. How? The faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's why we teach the word of God. That's why you need to be in the word of God and you need to test everything that is said and done according to the word of God. That's, that's your anchor. That's your anchor. But then he goes on a little later, go across to James chapter 2 and verse 14. What, is, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? And then he talks about a brother and sister in need, and, and then we just blow them off. And, ah, well, you know, go, God bless you, go ahead. When you have the ability to meet their need. Now, much could be said about that. But when we get to verse 17, he says, Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. In other words, if you have true faith, it has to be demonstrated. It will be demonstrated. It cannot help but be demonstrated. If you're living, if you're not if you're conscious and active, it has to be there. It has to be present. And if it's not present, then it's dead. And that's the same word, by the way, used in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. You were dead in trespasses and sin. Same word exactly. Now, that's a very serious matter. And he's not saying saved by faith plus works. He's saying that true faith produces works. Or another way of putting it, he's not, it's, it is not a faith ending in words, but in actions. In fact, I think one writer stated, workless faith is worthless faith. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good little tongue twister. And it's a change that is incorporated into salvation, a, a contrast with the past, which is what, again, 517 is all about. A doing or working in accordance with the new birth and new relationship with God. And by this change comes action with endurance and perseverance, bringing assurance. It's a happy thing to serve God. Christ said even when you're persecuted, for your faith and your love and whatever you do, you are blessed. You are blessed. And let me just, let's get you to go to a little further over to Peter. Let's go to Peter. Now, Peter is not only an apostle, but has firsthand knowledge of failing his Lord, which, I, you know, I, in that sense, I'm, I'm thankful for. That gives us all hope, doesn't it? And he emphasizes the strength of salvation coming from God making new creatures. If we look, first of all, at verse 3, of, this is 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's 521, isn't it? It's all God's doing. It's not our, and that is always the foundation. Then look down at verse 5. He, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This protection of God, this new creaturehood of God produces is a power of God through faith. It's seen through faith, which is a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then we move down to verse 5. Excuse me, let me move you down to verse 8. And though you have not seen him, 
you love him, and though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. He is telling us here that this sanctification is something that is useful, that is fruitful, that produces a new character, a new way of thinking. And then he says, in, uh, let me back up to verse 6. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Notice that, greatly rejoice. Even in the midst of these trials. He, and he says, So that the proof, verse 7, of your faith the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything is focused by faith upon all of these promises of God, and we are living for Him now, and in the process of that, we love Him, and in the process of that, we have a joy unspeakable and full of glory not because everything is a smooth highway, but because of a relationship with Him that is supernatural. Now, if that's not enough, go over to 2 Peter. Let's see it again. In 2 Peter, his second letter, chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Seeing that His divine power is granted to us everything to pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. Going through trials, going through difficulties, he says, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through this knowledge that we have of Him, through this faith in what He has promised. We can live in the midst of the mess. We can deal with the troubles because our God is greater than all of that stuff and all of His promises reside upon us. Hallelujah. And notice down in verse 8, he's already, he describes all of the things that pertain to this divine nature that we now have. And then when we get down to verse 8, he says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. There's that word fruitful there again that we've been talking about. In the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's a true knowledge, there's a true relationship and he goes on to say, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. That blindness there may mean that he's truly not his. And then notice verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing of you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Only a person born again can do this. Living out such brings assurance and joy. And this is, this is not working for salvation, but it's obedience in salvation, bringing the peace and assurance of God to our hearts that we are about His business, and there's nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I must hurry. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3. And he adds to this in verse 3, giving no cause for offense in anything so that the ministry will be not discredited. This is the negative side. And if there are no works of God, no evidence of God's perspective, attitude, and holy character, no new creaturehood, the ministry is discredited. And that's what's going on now, right? And so much of what's going on in the name of Christian is going on in this dissipated, empty bunch of stuff that's like the wind blowing here and there, which means nothing, and when it, it just blows by and nothing's been accomplished. It cannot represent our perfect Lord. I'm reminded of, and won't get you to turn there for time, of Ephesians 4. After the theology that is there, Paul talks about the fact that I'm the prisoner of the Lord. He was previously a prisoner of Satan. 
And such are all that are new in Christ, previously a prisoner of Satan, now a prisoner of the Lord. And he says, I urge you, there's that word again, to walk worthy of the calling for which you have been called. That's what Paul is doing here to these Corinthians. It's the same message. It's a consistent message. Walk worthy of the calling for which you've been called. Churches are filled with unconverted people and weak or false messages that don't change anybody. And such places are not representing Christ. He says here the ministry be not discredited. These are churches that have no credit with God. There's nothing there of any true, lasting, eternal value with God. Oh, my, my brethren, if we don't have credit with God, I don't care what our size is. What, why do we, why, why exist? What is our purpose? To pat each other on the back? Or to serve the true and the living God, praying that people would be converted and turn to Him and love Him and serve Him and that the gospel would be spread and that people would know the true and the living God. All right. Now we generally close the service with Jude 24 and 25. I guess you know that. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and so forth. Turn with me just in, in, in closing here. In closing here, next to the last book in the Bible, the little one chapter book of Jude. And Jude is about apostasy. And really and truly that's what Paul is dealing with the Corinthians. Don't apostatize. Don't follow another gospel, which is not a gospel. Don't get diverted away from the true and the living God. And so the whole little writing here of Jude is about that. And notice, beginning in verse 17, after he has explained that, he turns the attention to those in, that he's writing to. In the same way that Paul turns his attention to those at Corinth that he is writing to, both the saved and the unsaved. But here he's talking particularly to the beloved. He says, But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. Aha, but here it is. But you, beloved, notice, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, or on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, prayer, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And in the process of that, he says, and have mercy on some who are doubting and save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. The only association we should have with those that don't know Christ and are going the wrong direction is to try to help them go the right direction. To help them know Christ, to snatch them as brands from the burning. But you see how wonderful and how exclusively is the gospel of Jesus Christ and how important it is to the church. There's not anything that can take its place. And then when we have it, and only then can we be a blessing to others, living out a testimony for the calling we have before our family, before our children, before our church, before our neighbors, before anybody at work or school or anybody that's all around us. How can we help others if we're not doing so and if we're not serious in our relationship to God? God help us to follow the same admonition that He gives 
to these Corinthians because we live in a troubled time and situation just like they do. That in when it's all said and done, he'll say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Nobody's ever going to be ungrateful for those words, believe me. That's the most wonderful words that could ever be spoken by our Lord to any one of us. Well done, good and faithful servant. Let me ask you to pray with me, please. Father, we thank you for the clarity and preciousness of your word. Truly, it is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, we love it. And we pray that you would help us to love it even more. And we ask you to forgive us where we fail you with it, where we don't get it accurate or we fail to, to apply it properly to our own lives. Oh, Father, help us to do that. Thank you for your endurance with each one of us. Please bless everyone in the sound of my voice that, Father, they would first of all know you, and then they'd be encouraged to live for you. We thank you so much for all the instruction and blessings that you bring from your word that is so precious and dear. Help us, mighty, mighty Lord. We look to thee and praise you. Amen.